Welcome to A Moment of Bach, where we take our favorite moments from the composer's vast musical output, just a minute's worth or even a few seconds, and show you why we think they are remarkable. We are your hosts, Christian and Alex Kiebert. Today's moment is from the very beginning of the opening chorus of the St. John Passion. Piercing dissonances from oboes played a half step apart. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. The words of this psalm look bright on the page, but the music pulls them into shadow. In the next several bars, more dissonances accumulate, sustaining tension. The ensemble wanders away from the home key, and then back. Whereupon the cycle begins again, now with a chorus singing. Herr, unser Herrscher, Lord, our ruler. One of my favorite hymn texts of all time is Lord, Thee I Love With All My Heart, and In the Lutheran service book here, the text of this is, Lord, let at last thine angels come to Abraham's bosom, bear me home, that I may die unfearing. And in its narrow chamber keep my body safe in peaceful sleep until thy reappearing. Then there's a little bit more after that, but let me just interject and say, The reason I chose to read that is because it's used in this work, the St. John Passion. Just as he did in the St. Matthew Passion, Bach sets the story of Jesus' suffering and death to music told by an evangelist, a tenor soloist. Interjected by poetic and emotional expressions These interjections come in the form of solo arias. They come in the form of ariosos, which are really similar to the arias, usually as lead-ups into the arias, as chorale fantasias, but most notably for Bach, as chorales, which is basically like a verse of a hymn. We talked about this way back in episode 9 for the first time. In that episode, we talked about the St. Matthew Passion and the various chorales that Bach sprinkles in. Now, in the St. John Passion, it's no different. And the text that I read for you from Lord, Thee I Love With All My Heart is something that he uses right at the end of the St. John Passion. This verse is about what it is like to die and what the Christian belief is about that. In other words, after you die, you await the resurrection of the dead. Whether or not you ascend to heaven as a believer right away, or whether or not you wait for the resurrection of the dead, or whether or not the time scale of that matters at all, is up for debate in various religions or various interpretations. But basically, the sentiment remains here, that just as Jesus died and was dead for a bit and then rose again from his own power, so also we would die and be in our, in our sleep of death for a while and then rise again by his power. So what you just heard there is a little bit of the ending chorale. And I kind of don't want to like spoil the very, very end of this for you, although it's not like a story you don't know, probably. <laughs> but, but hearing the ending chorale 
is kind of what this whole thing leads up to. But before that ending chorale, there is a fantastic ending chorus, which is a little bit more of a a little bit more of an original piece by Bach instead of a setting of a of a tune that people would have known like these chorales are. This chorus is fantastic, and I'm sure we'll hit it in another episode at some point, just like we've got to hit that ending chorus of the St. Matthew Passion at some point, right, Christian? Fantastic. Oh, yeah. An amazing thing. And then we haven't talked about the opening of the St. Matthew Passion, but I'm getting ahead of myself because today we're talking about the opening of this, the St. John Passion. This very one that ends with the sentiment talking about our own death and our own narrow chamber of our grave, right? I mean, these things are not lighthearted material, of course, but the St. John Passion is a little bit special in a certain way. Like, these are two different accounts of the same story, right? And there are four in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the St. Matthew Passion is just a reading straight out of the Gospel of Matthew with the interjections the poetic interjections. And then the St. John Passion, it's that for the Gospel of John. And John, theologians say, typically focuses a little bit more on Jesus's divinity Mm. and the miracles. And John is a little more poetic than the other three guys were, I think, in terms of his writing style too. But what Bach chooses to do here is to center this around us, really, and our, our experience of understanding this. It is all about Jesus and his suffering and pain, but it is framed with this sense of us pondering this. It's about it's about how we experience it. And at the end here, it's about learning from Jesus how to die. It's kind of a fantastic verse of, it's kind of one of my favorite hymn verses from Go to Dark Gethsemane, which has this in there too. It's about learning from Jesus how to pray because he prayed in the garden. Learning from Jesus how to die, right? Learning from Jesus how to rise. And the chorale tune, Jesus, I Will Ponder Now, is sprinkled in here a lot. And that's all about me thinking about Jesus, right? Like, I will ponder now on your holy passion. So we've talked a little bit before about how some of these things are instructional. It's not just artistic. It's not just a concert. In a way, it's a church service, but... It's also a performance with parts being played, like the part of Jesus and Pilate and Judas and all that. But it's also instructional. These were intended as spiritually didactic experiences for people. This was a way to learn how to pray and to learn how to understand about our own mortality and why we should trust in God. And that's why it ends the way it does. But the very beginning in this instrumental introduction contains my favorite moment and is what I want to zero in on musically today. The text for this movement is, O Lord, our ruler, whose glory is magnified in all lands, testify to us by your passion that you, the true Son of God, have at all times even in the time of deepest lowliness, been glorified. Right away in this first measure of the entire thing, you can hear the complexity happening. First, let's listen for those high notes that you hear in the higher flutes and oboes. Now let's hear those first few measures again and listen for the 16th notes or the faster notes in the violins. And then, of course, that pulsing low bass note. In some of the interviews that you can find for this performance by the Netherlands Bach Society, the conductor Jos van Veldhoven talks about this tormented figure, these da 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 things coming up a lot in the St. John Passion, and always to represent torment. (laughs) 
and he uses the term leitmotif, and he acknowledges that that term was invented later to describe the works of Richard Wagner, who came more than 100 years after Bach. And that music sounds a lot different, and it uses a technique called leitmotif, in which a small motive or a small theme represents a person or feeling or place or whatever, and it's, it's this is used in movie scores all the time. And you don't see it a lot in stuff from the Baroque era, but Van Velthoven makes the case that it does appear here. I like that interpretation. Definitely in the Baroque era, each musical part of something, or each each piece, each movement, represented a, a tone or or a character or quality. In German, it would be affect. But to say that there that within something is a is a theme that represents something is being a little bit more precise, I think. Yeah, and he makes the point this da 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 thing. It's not always in a stepwise motion like that, but they're almost always sixteenth notes, and they represent torment. And it's interesting that you said Christian affect because I think I'm not sure we've talked about that yet, but it's a really important term for music of this style. Definitely, it drives. I mean, it's it's why Baroque music sounds like it is in a sectional sense, yeah. how Baroque music starts off and then it's just going and it's just going, 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 going until it's over. Right. It's it's trying to achieve a certain affect for each movement of music. And sometimes like the lead up to a movement will get you in the mood for that. So affect, I mean, could be translated as mood or vibe, I guess is a way to, to say To update it, it to yeah. modern speak, we could we could say that in Baroque music, each part or each movement or each piece is designed to have its own vibe. Yeah. And that really is the closest like actual modern word that means that. Yeah. And that's different than other styles of music. Yeah. As you get later into the Western classical music with Mozart and then Beethoven, they're essentially trying to cram in two or more vibes into one thing and switch off between sections within that's what sonata form is later for music theory people out there but yeah but um but here we're dealing with a musical style of expression that's one approximately one vibe per uh start and stop of three minutes three to six minutes section right and this is a long this is a long one this opening one but that makes sense it's the opening it's the opening movement they were usually longer but this one has to set the tone for the whole thing. So yeah, that's this one long. Yeah. And that's why I love this so much. It's similar to the St. Matthew Passion. The way the tone is set is so is done so strongly. I mean, it's there, there is no mistaking the tone of what this whole thing is going to be about by listening to this, right? Like, it immediately yeah. sounds grim and um, complex. Tortured. Tortured, very pained. And part of the, so the violin, the moving violin lines, even though Van Velthoven said that that's kind of the tortured thing, I think those sound kind of smooth and nice compared to the woodwind stuff, which is my favorite thing and which contains my moment. You've got flutes and oboes up here. And if you are looking closely, you'll see that there are two flutists and two oboists And if you're looking at a score or listening very closely, you can tell that flute one and oboe one are playing the same thing. Flute two and oboe two playing a different line. So there are two lines and they they kind of hand off to each other. And this is where the real torment comes in, I think. And let's examine that listen and Figure out why that sounds so pained. In the very first measure, there is a clash of a half step, otherwise known as a minor second, between those instruments. Listen to how that sounds on the piano together. In ear training class, when you are trying to identify what these intervals are, that's the one that 
that sounds the most dissonant played next to another one, you know, played together. Mm -hmm. You could also think of it as that's the closest that two notes can get to each other. It is in the West. Yeah, sure. And in the, the Western piano. system. Yeah. yeah on and piano. on a keyboard instrument. <laughs> yeah. With some qualifications. But yeah, I mean, basically, yes. And those notes really rub up against each other um, with friction. And then they need to resolve somewhere. But brilliantly, Bach doesn't just resolve them and make them sound pretty right away. In fact, he never resolves it until he finally gets to the cadence where the choir enters. And even then, we're in a minor key, so it doesn't sound like... It doesn't sound happy when it gets there. In fact, when the choir enters, you can hear it's got some real gravitas, but it's not, it's not a happy sound. It's on the word Lord. In the text, there's Lord, our ruler. <laughs> Again, setting this tone, I mean, this is just such, this is such a mood, as the kids say. <laughs> like, or a vibe, like we said. Vibe is the best word, honestly, for this. If you listen to those notes continue to rise, it's like this kind of rising tension. And sort of dread about what's going to happen. We have to think about context here. If you were going to see this be performed when it was performed back in the day, you would know some of these hymn tunes that you were going to hear in the chorale movements later, including the one at the very end of the whole work, two hours into it, right? It would mean a lot to you because you knew what it meant before they even started singing it. But you would also, even though you wouldn't know this original material that Bach has created for this opening movement, nor would you know the original melodies that he created for the arias, you would immediately get the sense of the mood of this by hearing this. And you do know, what you do know going in, context-wise, is the story. Everybody would have been familiar with it. I shouldn't say everybody. I mean, maybe not everybody, but certainly most people would be familiar with the story of Jesus' death. And that gets us to my very favorite moment, my very favorite one of these dissonances, which is this high note. It's a high C up there in the high flute and oboe. That leads down to a B natural, which is out of our key and sounds really weird against the other stuff that's happening. And it keeps on twisting chromatically down to the end of this phrase. meaning that it keeps going down by half step, which as we've said is the smallest distance it can go. This very dissonant, chromatic, winding figure heading into the choral entrance. One of the vocal soloists, Angus McPhee, on the Netherlands Bach Society recording of this as part of the interviews, he mentions Sweeney Todd by mm. Stephen Sondheim. And he talks about how, like, obviously that's not about the same kind of thing. But at the beginning of that, the music, you don't need any any characters. Nobody comes out yet. There's You don't even need to look at the set dressing yet to understand what's happening. The music has this immediate sense of churning dread to it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that's going to permeate the entire work. And that's exactly what's happening here. So many great movements within the St. John Passion. So many that we don't have time for on this episode. But I'd like to point out one more thing from the opening movement, which I really love. When the choir enters, they sing the word Herr three times. So Lord, Lord, Lord. And this is an interpretive choice that the Netherlands Bach Society does. They sing the first one kind of loud and short, second one pretty similarly, and then on the third one, they sing it with a, a lot more drama, kind of. They sing it softer and uh, longer, kind of. You know, it's, it's more pleading. 
mm-hmm. on that third one. And the voices, they get closer together. If you look at the outer voices, the soprano and basses, on those three exclamations, we start really high and go down, and basses also go move up. So that last hair, the longer one, is tighter with the vocal voicing, the chord voicing mm. of those mm-hmm. f- of those four voice parts. Yeah, we've we've implored you to do this before, listener. But if you haven't, you got to look up these scores, the autograph manuscripts by Bach, especially if you know how to read music. And I've even said that even if you don't, you can sometimes try to like follow it. I know that's going to be hard if you don't know how, especially finding where like the system breaks are. Bach does write them in, but it's it's hard. But anyway, you should look at this because it, it is beautiful looking. And you can always find these scores online, typically at the International Music Score Library, um, which is IMSLP. And that is a great resource for classical music, pretty much any public domain music. And I'm looking at this beautifully drawn manuscript box Penmanship is always really neat to to look. I mean, it, I shouldn't use the word neat. It's not the neatest in the world, but it's it's really cool to. It's kind of artful looking, and it it gives you the picture of what's happening metaphorically in the music. Like you said, Christian, that third choir note of hair. It's like tighter and closer, and if you just look at it on the page, it's very obvious that's what's happening. So knowing that, I'm sure is what made um, the director. Van Veldhoven decide he was going to interpret that a certain way. Have those first ones be a little more declamatory. And then have that third one be a little more tender. These voices kind of come closer together. So I encourage you, um, listener, if you know Bach well, and if you know the St. Matthew Passion well, which is the one that people know more in general. I encourage you to check this out. It is, by any metric you could you could measure, um, whether objective or subjective, it is just as much of a masterwork as the St. Matthew Passion. I mean, I'm pretty sure any metric will be subjective for that, <laughs> for that particular thing. But the point is, is that you can look at it and I, it's pretty, it's pretty obvious that it's, it's just as carefully constructed as the others of Bach's great pieces. And, you know, like one of the reasons we do this podcast is because Bach is uh, pretty consistently great, you know, and we've talked about that many times. Christian and I will always say this, like just today we, we listened to part of this and I, we were just both like, this is a good piece. <laughs> like, I'm not surprised. It always passes the test of <laughs> yeah, of being good. Okay. Bach is good. You guys hot take still have yet to uncover the bad Bach piece. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's in there somewhere. Maybe not. Maybe it's not. I don't know. I've never heard it. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I don't think it exists. And now, here is that moment from the opening chorus of the St. John Passion. If this introduction to a musical moment has inspired you to hear the rest of the St. John Passion, please see the link in the episode description for the performance by the Netherlands Bach Society. To hear our new episodes as we release them, find us on your podcast app and hit subscribe. We are on just about every podcast platform that I think you can be on. And if you enjoy the podcast, give us a rating on iTunes. That helps us out. It helps us get found by other people who are looking for this type of thing. Mm -hmm. All right, Christian, what are we going to look at next week? Next week, we will stay with the St. John Passion for one more week. As we look at something with a completely different vibe, an aria... A soprano aria 
ich folge dir gleichfalls. Until next time, enjoy those moments.